The truth is I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now in terms of looking after churches, in terms of working with New Frontiers, in the way that I'm doing it. If it wasn't for Andy and Teresa's encouragement, their propulsion, sometimes their boot up the backside. (laughs) And uh, when Andy moved up here to Scotland, Andy and Teresa and the family moved up here to Scotland, uh, Andy said, would you now lead the team that I'm leading? And I thought, oh my goodness, I don't think I had the grace or the skill or anything to do it and Andy kind of like pushed me into it and said no you go for it and uh, when you do that when you step into something that uh, God has ordained for you you almost never feel equipped you almost never feel qualified you almost never feel able but if you know God's in it you can step out in faith and uh, as you guys have stepped out in faith here we've been stepping out in faith where we are and just seeing what God's doing now I want to bring something to you which I know will resonate with you, and I know you know this stuff. So I don't come with any fresh revelation, really. I come to just stir what God's already doing in you, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the kingdom of God in life. Now, I know you know this stuff, and I know in one sense I could sit here and you could be teaching me a whole lot of stuff here, but I also feel from God there's a provocation from him that to equip us and to stir us and to provoke us all to be involved with this. When I, as a 16-year-old lad, when I first encountered a crazy bunch of people like you, I'd come out of a very traditional world. I'd come out of a very traditional church. My parents had been brought up as uh, reformed evangelical. They'd gone to uh, be part of a church in London led by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Some of you will know that name. He kind of shaped a lot of our theology in terms of new frontiers and our understanding of grace and our understanding of the gospel. And, uh, but there was very little understanding in my experience of the Holy Spirit and his power. And I came across a bunch of crazies like you guys, and at 16 years old, my life was totally transformed because I encountered the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God filled me, empowered me, changed my whole world. And I came across a phrase that I'd never heard before. I'd been in churches all my life for 16 years. I'd probably been a follower of Jesus personally. I'd committed my life to him at the age of eight. So for eight years, I knew about the gospel. I knew about Jesus. I knew that actually I trusted him for salvation. I knew that if I had died that day that I would go to be with him. I knew that he'd saved my soul. I knew that stuff. But I didn't really understand the message of Jesus was all about a little phrase that he spoke more about than anything else, which was the kingdom of God. And suddenly my life was transformed as I understood that all of life mattered. I'd grown up thinking that it was just the hour, and it was an hour in those days, uh, just an hour on Sunday that kind of really mattered. That was what it was about. That was God's little time bit, and if we lived for him, that was the bit we gave to him. The rest of the life was mine. And, uh, or, or at best, he had one day. It was the Lord's day. All the rest were my days. <laughs> and, uh, but I suddenly realized that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And Jesus came declaring, as you well know, the message of the kingdom. He spoke, I think, 82 times in the New Testament about the kingdom of God. God's rule, God's reign expressed practically in life. Now, rather than teach this from the Gospels, I actually want to go right back to Genesis. I want to go right back to the beginning and teach this from the first chapter of Genesis. So if you've got a Bible... I wonder if you could turn to Genesis chapter 1. I believe the verses are going to come up. I'm going to read chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. It's so good to root this into biblical theology. It's so good to root this into God's original purpose. God's original plan for mankind was to represent him was to be agents, was to be viceroys, was to be those who co-reigned with him on earth. That's why man was created, to represent his image on earth. Let's read what God says in Genesis chapter 1, 26 down to 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Interesting how the word our gets slotted in there almost without noticing it, this 
Trinitarian God who has relationship in his very heart. He didn't create man out of some void. He didn't create man because he was a needy God all on his own for eternity. Quite a sad old fellow. No, actually he had perfect Trinitarian relationship within himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit enjoying themselves together and actually we're made into that relationship. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Now, what are we supposed to do? Let them rule over creation. And he's now just going to list what he's just created. The fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man. In his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves along the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the place of the earth, every tree that has fruit and seed in it. It will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move along the ground and everything that has breath and life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And then verse 31 is amazing. God saw that all he'd made and it was very good. Lord, we thank you that your creation is very good. We thank you that we are made in your image. We ask you today, Holy Spirit, just as you've been so powerfully with us as we've sung our worship, we ask you now as we worship, as we hear the word of God, we ask you that your word would be living, active, sharp, Lord, your word would stir us, provoke us. Your word would challenge and change us as we encounter you in Jesus' name. Amen. God says this. He says, let us make man in our image. We're called primarily to be those who bear God's image. You see, we're so different from every other aspect of creation. This is where those who believe in evolution, who see that just as a process, that we're just the product of some genetic code that's let go, that actually we're just naked apes, as Devson Morris once said, that we're just those who've evolved. That's where they don't understand. Actually, we're very different from the rest of creation. See, all the rest of creation is good. God said it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. But then he said, let us make man in our image. The orangutan is not made in the image of God. Although looking out this morning, no, let's not go there. (laughs) It was a joke, by the way, in case you're already offended. Um, The animals are not in the image of God. Creation is not in the image of God. It's a beautiful aspect of his creativity, but we, mankind, both male and female, are the only ones created in the image of God. Everything else was good, but this is very good, because this is created, this is made in the very image of God. And you see, Moses, who's writing this under the inspiration of the Spirit, he's actually being very subversive with the words that he's using. It's important that we understand the context into which every biblical passage is written because every biblical passage has a context. Unless we understand that, we actually don't get the full benefit of how it was originally spoken, how it was originally heard, how it was originally understood. And Moses is writing in a particular culture of Egypt and Mesopotamia and particularly the pharaohs who ruled and the other kings who ruled in that area had a particular theology, had a particular doctrine, and that was this. We are the sons of God. We are the divine, i.e. we the kings alone, we the pharaohs alone. We're the sons. of. We're the only ones made in the image of God. You else are all just ants. You're just workers. You're just those who can build me pyramids and houses and whatever, but I'm the one in the image of God, and you must bow down and worship me. And often the pharaohs would make literal representations of themselves because, surprise, surprise, they didn't have the BBC and iPods and iPads, and they didn't have media that we have today. So nobody really knew what the pharaoh looked like unless they'd seen him physically, but actually millions of people could see the image of God by seeing the pharaoh's statue and bowing down and worshipping him. And Moses is totally subverting that. Moses is bringing the truth of God to say it's not about pharaoh ruling and reigning. It's not about the king who's in the image of God. It's not about the king who's the son of God. Actually, this is about all 
all God's people being in the image of God. That's God's original purpose, that he made us to reflect his image. We're in his image, and we're called to rule, and we're called to reign. We're called to be God's vice-regents, God's viceroys, God's ambassadors on planet Earth. They thought it was just the king who was supposed to do that. But actually Moses says, no, all of God's creation in terms of humanity are supposed to be in the image of God. And then Moses unfolds it. We haven't got time to look at it this morning. But Moses unfolds this revelation to say, but that image has been marred. But that image has been spoiled. But we've lost the power and authority to rule and to reign because we took it to ourselves. Now, it's ever so interesting to see how that happens. You get this little slithering snake that comes into the garden. It should have been a bit of a clue, really. I don't think any of the other animals talked. But you suddenly got a talking snake in the garden, and somehow that should have caused Adam and Eve to say, hang on a minute, we've got a problem here. The giraffe doesn't talk, the orangutan isn't talking, but we've got a talking snake. And actually, we think, where does evil come from? Well, we don't know. That's a mystery in God. But we do know this, the snake should not have been in the garden. You see, the garden was the first temple paradise. It was the place where God's rule and reign was perfectly expressed. In fact, Adam and Eve, we'll find out in a minute, were supposed to fill the whole earth with that temple paradise. Eden was not supposed to be contained. It was supposed to be spread throughout the whole earth because God's plan and purpose is that through all the earth, the knowledge of his glory should cover every part of the planet as waters cover the sea. And actually, Adam and Eve were supposed to be priests to God, and they were supposed to bring God's rule and God's reign into life. It's interesting the wording in Genesis 2.15. That's a game where we don't understand it unless we understand the context and some of the word structures. Genesis 2.15 says this, they were called to work and care for the garden. Now, that just sounds like he's a bit of a gardener. Just sounds like he's a bit of an Alan Titchmarsh. He's a bit green, they're a bit green fingered. Well, actually, it was a load more than just gardening. The, exactly the same words are used in numbers about the priesthood. Exactly the same phrase. And that's translated to serve and to guard. And they were supposed to guard the garden. They were supposed to rule in the garden. They were supposed to bring God's kingdom and something that shouldn't have been there should have alerted them and said, no, you're not welcome in this garden. We're ruling on God's behalf. Get out of the garden, snake. Don't interplay with it. Don't talk to it. But they do talk to it. And it's very interesting what the snake says to them. It basically causes them to distrust God basically causes them to undermine their relationship with God, to undermine their trust in God. Has God really said? And what the temptation is, he says, if you eat the tree, eat the fruit of the tree, then you will really know the difference between good and evil. You won't have to ask God. You'll be God's yourself. The temptation was you could rule and reign if you eat the apple, if you eat the fruit. The irony was they're already ruling and reigning. They've already got that. They've already kings. They're already, uh, I mean, they're, they're already doing that stuff. And the, sna- and the snake does that today. The serpent still does that today. He'll say, if you want to be really happy, then that relationship with that person, watch that on the television. Look up that on the internet. Sniff that substance if you want real peace. If you want real joy, drink that. And he lies to you all the time. When actually we've got real joy. We've got real happiness. We've got real peace. We've got it if we're in the kingdom of God. And he lies all the time. And of course, they give in to the lie. And something happens to mankind. Something happens where there becomes like this disjointing. There becomes like this out of kilter. It becomes like there's a separation between God's kingdom, God's heaven and earth. And somehow a man is banished from the garden. He's banished from the temple. He's no longer longer allowed to go even into God's presence. There's this disconnect that happens at the fall. That's a falling away from God and from God's presence. But right at the beginning, there's this wonderful echo that one day... God is going to come and put it all right again. God is going to come and restore it again. God is going to come and realign creation. God is going to come and bring heaven to earth. God is going to come and he's going to once again bring his presence to mankind. 
And there's a little clue in it that says it's to do with the seed of the woman. And it's a bit strange, a bit weird. We don't really understand, or they didn't probably really understand what that meant. We now understand what that means. We now understand that that's all about Jesus. We now understand that the seed of the woman is actually Jesus who came from heaven to earth as the God-man. We understand he came as the joined-up man. He came as the one representing the kingdom of heaven. He came as God's presence. You see, it was foretold about Jesus. One day he will come and he will be Emmanuel, God with you. The presence of God come. God coming again to join up heaven and earth. God coming again to put us right. God coming again to put into joint everything that's been put out of joint. And as a result of the fall, it's like we became these ruined castles. I don't know if you, I mean, you have them here in Scotland better than we do in England, but the town I grew up in, Hastings, it's kind of known for its ruined castle. Dates back to 1066, which is the only thing Hastings is famous for, losing to the French. It's a little strip of water about 25, 30 miles between us and France. And as my old pastor used to say, on a bad day, you can see France. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got this kind of enmity with France, us in Hastings. And, uh, but we've got this ruined castle. And the ruined castle, it was William the Conqueror built it, lived there, whatever. And, you know, once upon a time it was glorious. Once upon a time something really important happened there. Once upon a time there was rule and reign and authority from Hastings Castle. Now it's just a tourist attraction. Now it's just a pile of old bricks. And that's what humanity can feel like. But actually, we were born for greatness. Actually, we were born to rule and reign. Actually, we were born to represent God's authority, to be his kingdom power and authority and presence on planet Earth. That's the very purpose of mankind. And we get that restored in Jesus. Jesus came, it said, to destroy the work of the enemy to turn it all around. And on the cross, when Jesus died, when he paid for our sin, when he gave his life as an atoning sacrifice, when he took upon himself all your out-of-jointness, when he took upon himself all your out-of-fellowship with God, when he took upon himself all your lust and your greed and your shame and your fear and everything, when he took upon himself that and he paid for it, he dealt with the separation between man and God. And at that very point, when he said, it is finished, not I'm finished, (laughs) it's finished, I've done it, I've accomplished it, I've come and given my life. At that very point, it said, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. That's a strange thing to happen, unless you understand that the temple was like the last bit of Eden left. The temple even looked like Eden. Actually, the inner sanctum of the temple was even like Eden. There was the colors of Eden. There was the, it, it represented Eden. It represented the presence of God on planet Earth. It represented what used to be, that God lived on planet Earth, that God was with us on planet Earth, that his kingdom rule and kingdom reign was there in the garden. And actually, the sad thing was that only one man once a year could press into that. Only one man once a year could go into the very presence of God to offer atonement. And even then it was with fear and trembling and blood. Just in, And they said, allegedly, it's not in the Bible, but allegedly they wrapped a rope around the high priest's leg just in case he died in the presence and we had to pull him out. And he's dead. He's supposed to be in there. I'm not getting him out. We'll pull him out on the rope. They were fearful of the presence. They were frightened what they might mean in terms of judgment. But suddenly God says, I no longer have a problem with mankind. We are no longer out of joint. We're no longer out of kilter. We're no longer separated because of the cross, because of the blood of Jesus, because he offered himself once and for all as a beautiful atoning sacrifice for our sins. Because everything was placed on Jesus, the temple veil is ripped from top to bottom. Man has now access into the presence of God. God knows no longer has a problem with us. And in Jesus, in Christ, we are restored again to be those to rule and to reign on planet earth. God's original intention is restored in Christ. Let me give you a New Testament verse just to corroborate that. It says this in Romans 5, verse 17. For if... And Paul's using a device when he says if. He doesn't mean 
well, if, he means, well, if, if this happened, then that certainly has happened. He says this, for if by the trespass of one man, what's he talking about? Adam's sin, Adam and Eve's sin. If by their sin, death reigned through that one man. Well, if, well, it did. Through their sin, through their rebellion, through their breaking of God's relationship, through their choosing to go their own way, actually there was separation. Death did reign from that point. Well, if that happens, he says this, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness, that's the gospel, that's Jesus, the abundant provision of grace that we're saved freely, not by our effort or our works or our achievement, but simply because of what Jesus has done on the cross and therefore the gift of righteousness, we're given freely his righteousness as a gift, not earning it, freely given. If through that, if by that, that's happened, what does it say about us? We will reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Reign in life. This is God's purpose. This is God's heart for you as a community. This is God's heart for us as those who are now followers of Jesus, that we are those who rule and reign in life. It means that every circumstance needs to be brought under that rule. It means that every issue in our lives needs to be brought under that reign. It means that we don't just sit at home and pray about it, but a little bit like Adam and Eve, we have to walk in it. So they had to walk in their rule. They had to walk in their reign. In fact, for them, they had to do some gardening. Their reign had to be expressed in seed time and harvest. Their reign had to be expressed in pulling up some weeds. You see, the weeds didn't come as a result of the fall. Now, thorns and thistles did, and that work became harder and more difficult. But they were still, before the fall, called to work, called to work it out, called to express that reign in life. And dear friends, this is my second point, we're called to do that. We're called to bear fruit. They were called to be fruitful, to increase in number, to fill the earth and subdue it. Now, obviously, there's a procreation aspect to that. And In one sense, in Christ, that procreation is still continuing. It's ever so interesting when Jesus gathers his disciples at the end of the gospel, it almost exactly, theologians will tell you, it almost exactly mirrors the Genesis account when he calls them. Because he says, now go and be fruitful. Go into all creation. Go into all the world and procreate. Make disciples. See, Adam was told through a fruitful wife that Adam and Eve, through their fruitful relationship, would fill all the earth with little Adams and Eves. Now Jesus, the new Adam, or the, the last Adam, the new man, Jesus, through a very fruitful wife, his church, the bride of Christ, is calling out of relationship the bride to go and bear fruit everywhere. To go and have little Jesuses everywhere. Little Christians. That's what Christians mean. Christian means little Christs. That's what we're called to do. We're called to reproduction. We're called to do that. This is not some proselytization that we're doing. This is not just, oh, get a few numbers up. We're, this is the Great Commission. This is what God originally called Adam and Eve to do. Fill, the, fill all the earth with God worshippers. Fill all the earth with those in the image of God. We're called to do that, dear friends. I'm so thrilled with what you're doing. I'm so thrilled with how you're reaching out and seeing people touched and saved and encountering God. That is our commission. That's not just for a strange bunch of crazies. That's for all God's children, for all God's people that we should be, those who procreate, be those who bring the message of the kingdom and call people to relationship with him. But it's interesting, Adam was also told to garden. He was told to pull up some weeds. He was told where he saw something that didn't align with the kingdom, something that didn't align with God's beauty, something that didn't align. He was called to pull it out. And we're called to do that. Now, I think there's a physical aspect of that. I think, actually, if we're not careful, we become super spiritual. And actually, God wants us to be super spiritual. But the super spirituality that we have is earthed on earth. See, Jesus said, your kingdom come, not up in the heavenlies. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And it's so important that we understand that this earth is not the devil's. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Now, there's a worldly system. 
But Jesus didn't say, take them out of the world. He said, keep them from its systems, keep them from its values. I don't want them to be of the world, Father. I don't want them to be of the world. Don't let them be of its nature, of its values and systems and culture, but keep them in the world because Jesus knew that our temptation is to withdraw from the world. Our temptation is to think that this is the spiritual and that is the dirty, dirty secular world out there. Have you ever heard Christians talk about that? If ever you hear a Christian talk about spiritual, the separation between spiritual and secular, slap them. <laughs> You've got our authority to do that because it's just not, it's just not right. You know, we don't have secular jobs. We have jobs. There isn't secular music. There's music. There isn't secular art. There's art. There aren't secular people. Actually, it's all God's world. It's all one. And it's important, dear friends, that therefore, we, when we go to work, when we go and live in our neighborhoods, when we go and shop, we're not invading this dirty world. It's God's world, and we're coming as his ambassadors into it to bring his rule and authority. That means every area of life is sacred in that sense. Slap me. (laughs) Every area of life is important. Every area of life matters to God. And we're to do that. We'll go on in a moment to talk a little bit about this. But I think this pulling up weeds is a great image. And my wife is a great gardener. And uh, whenever we move, she reckons it takes three years to transform a garden, usually from pretty awful state into a pretty beautiful state. Just recently, uh, one of our neighbors or one of our uh, people who are involved with the housing development that we're on wrote to us and asked us to do something particular. And they said, oh, by the way, your garden must be the best in the Northwest. So I was like, well, not exactly the best in the Northwest, but probably the best on this estate, you know. <laughs> and people notice that. They notice what Anne does. But actually, people are going to notice when we pull weeds out. They're going to notice when we bring in the kingdom of heaven. And I think one of the prime ways we do that is the weeds of human relationships, the weeds that get in amongst us, the weeds of discord, the weeds of angst and stress and difficulty. Actually, we're called to rule and reign. We're called to bring God's kingdom in. Let me give you a couple of practical examples of this. You may have heard me give these examples before. I won't make no apology for saying them again. Let me remind you about Laura. Laura was a girl in one of our churches, is a girl in one of our churches, who was an NQT, newly qualified teacher. And uh, that means that she's been to college, she knows everything about teaching, but doesn't, hasn't actually done any of it. <laughs> so she's been trained and equipped, but now actually has to go and do it. And of course, they never give you the best class, do they, when you're a newly qualified teacher? You, you think they give you the best start. They, no, they give you the worst start in probably one of the worst schools. And so she starts life as a teacher in this really rough school, a really rough class. She's got the bottom of the lot, and uh, she's working away. Anyway, she, she said that not only was the atmosphere dreadful in the classroom, she said, do you know where it was worse? in the staff room. So she goes into the staff room. She said, oh, the atmosphere is dreadful here. The backbiting, the angst, the anxiety, the, just the weeds are growing all up. And she said, do you know where it was worse? It was hilarious. She said, it was worse in the staff fridge. And as she opened the staff fridge, instead of a nice warm waft coming out, what came out was all this anger. Because all the, you know those yellow stick it pads? You know those yellow stick it notes? It said, mine. Keep your thieving hands off. Who stole my milk, you son of a so-and-so? And it was like, whoa, you know, it's like all these things are on there. And obviously people were being quite territorial and uh, being quite ang- full of angst. And anyway, she said, oh God, how can I change the atmosphere of this school? You know, I'm not a governor, I'm not the senior teacher, I'm not head of department, I'm just the newly qualified teacher who doesn't even like it here. And she felt God whisper to her, go and buy the biggest carton of milk you can find and put my post-it note on it. And she says, no, sorry, God, I must be mishearing you. You know, zone out again. You know, <laughs> what did you really, you know, surely I'm going to need to get up at assembly and preach the gospel. No, no, he says, go and buy the biggest carton of milk you can find. So she's just obedient. Next day she does that. She goes and buys the biggest carton of milk she can find. She shoves it in the fridge. She puts God's stick it note on it says, free milk, help yourself. And she said, within a few days, all the other post-it notes embarrassingly started to come down. <laughs> she said, people... Because she did it every day for a week. People started to talk about, who is this 
gracious, kind, nice person. Who would buy milk for everybody? And they started to talk about random acts of kindness. And they started to talk about these things. And she said, within that first month, the whole atmosphere in the staff room totally changed. She said, then within the term, it started to change in the classroom. Guess what? Leadership matters. It started to change. And then she said, within that first year, the academic achievements of the school started to change. Now, I can't scientifically prove that that was down to Laura buying a few pints of milk under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but I believe it with all my heart. <laughs> Pulling up with... It matters. It matters praying for the sick. It matters showing compassion. It matters buying a few pints of milk. It matters that God... Don't say, oh God, it's so dark in this office. Yeah, that's, of course it's dark in the office. That's why, out of the mercy of God, he's put the light of the world into the office. You are the light of the world. And he's put you in that dark office. Yeah. Don't say, oh, I'm just praying for another Christian. Why? You're, you're, there's enough light from you. Now, God might, in his grace and sovereignty, give someone else to shine with you, because one can turn 1,000, two can turn 10,000. There is multiplication when you get Christians working together. But actually, you're enough to change it. Yeah. Darkness flees from the light. Light doesn't flee from darkness. A little candle in a window can be seen from miles around in the darkness. Thank God it's dark. That means that even your light shines. <laughs> you know? You don't have to be that great in the darkness. We just have to be who we are. Let me give you another illustration. I got this. I, people always laugh when I tell them this, but I got this from the one show. <laughs> I get all my... Do you, you have the one show in Scotland, because I've seen it when we're on holiday. We always holiday in Scotland, and I watch it even when I'm up here. I get all my cultural insights from the one show, and Alex and uh, Matt sitting on the sofa. Anyway, Alex and Matt are sitting on the sofa a year ago, just over a year ago, and suddenly on the sofa is this absolutely beautiful, beaming, Nigerian-looking lady, and uh, she's just sitting on the sofa there, just beaming away. And I think, oh, there's something special about her. I can see the light of God out of her eyes. I mean, she's not extraordinary, but there's, uh, what's, what's she going to be interviewed about? And they say, oh, we've got Mimi Asher with us, and she's going to tell, be telling her story. Anyway, this is Mimi Asher's story from the one show. Mimi described the estate that she lived on in London as, and I won't do her accent very well, but she says, not even a place that the devil himself would live. <laughs> she was Welsh, I know, yeah. <laughs> I won't do her accent. <laughs> in deference that there are some ladies of <laughs> different origin here, no. I, I, can't do, I can't do this wonderful Nigerian accent that she had, but she was so beautiful. She said, she said this, a place that not even the devil himself would walk through because the young people were terrorising the estate. It was a place called Brixton in South London. One gang member was pictured on the front of the Sun newspaper. Now, some of you know that the Sun is not the most edifying newspaper. And on the front of the Sun was this gang member from her gang brandishing a submachine gun. But to her horror, she found out that her son, Michael, had joined this gang. And that she decided to do something about Michael wrecking his life. So she began to take on the gang, not with violence, but with love. She started to invite the gang members into her home and cared for them by offering to feed them and wash their clothes. She helped set up a range of activities to give the young people positive things to do. They set up a football team. A football team? A football team. Cookery lessons. <laughs> Dance classes. <laughs> she prepared healthy meals with them and gave them safe access to learning and computer technology and training courses. And from there, a remarkable story emerged with the gang eventually being decommissioned by the love that Mimi constantly demonstrated. Through her witness over three years, not three months, not three weeks, not three minutes, we always want it quickly, don't we? Three years, but not three decades, three years. Mimi and her neighbours, because she recruited her neighbours into this, helped 60 young people out of the gang and have seen their lives totally transformed. The young man pictured with the submachine gun on the front of the Sun newspaper is now a respected mentor helping other young people to get out of the gangs. 
The ex-leader, Carl Loco. I mean, don't you know you were born to lead a gang if your name is Carl Loco? You, know, you don't mess with him, he's Loco, you know, Carl Loco. Is now, Carl Loco is now a successful musician and also acts as a mentor helping young people leave gangs. But the best news of all, and the one show report ended with this, it ended with, because you guessed it, Mimi is a Christian, it ends with Mimi's church service, her church meeting. The best news of all is that Michael, through this process, became a Christian and is now regularly preaching at Mimi's church. And the one show, this is the one show, secular, slap myself, shouldn't say secular, secular BBC, ungodly BBC, showing this church service, Nigerian black church service, wonderful, with this guy preaching the gospel of Mimi, beaming, (laughs) that's my boy, you know. (laughs) And you think, well, think this woman, she was not impressive. She was not an impressive woman, but she was full of love and passion, and she changed her world. Dear friends, take a look in the mirror. We're not all that impressive. We're not when you just kind of look at us. We don't look like we're the most powerful and most influential people on the planet, but we really are. We really are those who are called to change our estates, called to change our lives, called to bring change. Now, you guys are experiencing that big time in healing. I applaud you for that. We need to see much more breakthrough in the supernatural. But all of life is supernatural, and this is as supernatural to break through in council estates, to break through in relationships, to break through in fridges, to break through in these things. It's all about all of life being used for the glory of God. Let me end this by saying, I believe that we're called to take responsibility in all of life. Wherever God has put you, He's put you there for a plan and a purpose. It's not coincidence where he's put you. It's not coincidence where you're living. It's not coincidence in that office environment. And it's not coincidence that it's tough and dark because he's put you there to shine as a light. Now, let me just end this by saying you could just interpret everything I'm saying individually. And of course, we are individuals. We're not a faceless mass of people. We're individuals loved by God sovereignly. He's personally chosen you, picked you out. He's personally got a wonderful plan for your life. But you know what? Actually, it's in community that we see that plan most amplified. And like we said earlier, one can turn 1,000, but two can turn 10,000. What can 100 do? What can 1,000 do? Actually, the community of the life of God is amplified as we start to work together in each other's fri- with, e- with, e- with each other's friends. I love what that lady Barbara said. You know, come on, we've got we've got all this we've got this great catch of fish. Come and join us. Come, you know, come and come and help us catch up. Come and do that. That's wonderful. We need to be fishing in each other's ponds all the time. We need to be doing that and helping one another. We've got to produce, and you are doing it here. I just want to commend you for it. We've got to produce communities of the Spirit that shine out as light together. And that's why God wants to get you out of this place, do you know? He really does. You know, give as much as you can in two or three weeks' time, because we need a deposit on a building for the... Because we need to get out... We're kind of hidden away here a little bit, aren't we? And actually, I really believe God wants to get you in a much more visible place, a much more place where you can be seen and your light can shine. Because this is what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do you know what, dear friends? Our good deeds are important. We're not saved by them. We're saved solely by grace and mercy and love as a free gift. But actually, our good deeds, our good works, shout sometimes more than our words. Because people mishear our words, but they don't necessarily mishear our actions. And God is calling us to demonstrate, particularly to the downtrodden, the poor, the marginalized, the disadvantaged, particularly to those. And they can be some of the richest people in life and still be downtrodden, marginalized. They can still be poor in spirit, poor in relationships. Behind the nicest neck curtains, you can sometimes find some of the poorest people in heart. So this isn't about how much money you've got. It's about what relationship you've got. And actually, we're called to go to those people 
I came across this recently. It's the same kind of verse, but in Peter. I must have read it hundreds of times because I make a habit of trying to read through the Bible uh, in a year if I can. Don't always do it every year, but I try to keep on course with doing that. And I must have read this loads of times, but I came across it just recently in Peter. It says the same thing, but it has a little twist on it. And I think this is very important. In our day, when we're standing up for some pretty important issues that our society isn't, issues of life, The importance of life from the womb through to the nursing home. When we're standing up for godliness and sexuality. When we're standing up for things that the world doesn't like us for. In fact, the world hates us for it sometimes. Their attitudes, their values are very different. And this is what this verse says in Peter. Live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing... You've heard what they say about marriage, that it's between one man and one woman for life. Disgusting. Do you hear what they say, that it's not my right to kill this baby? Do you hear what they say, that we can't bump grandma off? It's dreadful what they say. It's disgusting. It's, it curbs my freedom. Well, they're accusing us of wrongdoing all the time. Live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Now, their talk about abortion, about euthanasia, about sexuality, according to the Bible, is ignorant and foolish. But we don't go round saying, you ignorant person, you foolish person. We, I mean, unfortunately, Christians have done that. And it hasn't won the battle. It hasn't won friends. They go around with their placards, ban this, ban that, anti this, anti that. I don't want to be known for anti. I want to be known for the love of God. What's going to soften their hearts? Actually, the Bible says it's the kindness of God or the love of God or the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And if God has done that in our hearts and led us to repentance, it's not hell, fire, and damnation. It's the love of God that changes. Now, sometimes we need to know about judgment. We need to know about standards and righteousness. But it's the love of God, dear friends, that we've got to live out and proclaim. It's good works. It's mercy. It's grace that God is calling us to do. Now, just to bring this in for an end, because our smiley face hasn't even come up yet. I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that the smiley face is well due over time. So, as if by magic, or actually not magic, but <laughs> as if by modern technology, which some people would call magic, <laughs> there's your smiley face. Let's just bring this into a landing. If you feel right now that God has put you in a particularly dark or difficult place, If you feel right now that God is calling you to stand up and rule and reign, you might be a Laura, you might be a Mimi, you might feel, do you know what, I don't feel that equipped, but you are equipped because you're part of this body, the community here is going to strengthen you, love you, and as we lay hands on you, the power of the Spirit's going to come upon you, and He's going to propel you out into the world. Sunday should be this wonderful gathering together of the army of God, garrisoning us up, filling us up with the Spirit. Why? So that we can go home happy? Well, yes, it's better than going home sad, but it's so that we can go out into the world full of the Spirit and live the Spirit-filled life in life, not just in church. Spiritual gifts are not just for church, they are for life. Works amongst the poor, loving one another is not just for Sunday morning, it's for Monday morning. Although this week, Monday's a bank holiday, so Tuesday morning... (laughs) It's for life. So if you feel that's you, if you feel it's actually at the moment a little bit hard, we want to strengthen you and stand with you. We want to applaud you. We want to say, God, thank you that you've put this dear sister, you've put this dear brother in a difficult position, in a difficult situation. Why? So that they might shine the light of Jesus and demonstrate the gospel in words and in action. If that's you, why don't you stand right now? Because we'd just love to pray with you and for you. Let's just, for a moment, see, we get so spiritual in church, don't we? We all kind of close our eyes. Look at these people. Look at them. These are your sisters. These are your brothers. But God, in his mercy, has allowed to go into difficult situations. Do you know, we actually applaud you. We applaud what God's done in you. We thank God. We literally applaud you. We thank thank God... We thank God that he's graced you 
And his love is so on you that he's put you in difficult places. Now, we don't then sit back and say, ha ha, good luck with that then. No, we stand with you, we pray with you, we lay hands on you, we ask right now that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit. So how are we going to end this meeting? I think Andy's going to direct us in terms of breaking bread, but how we're going to end this part of the meeting is that we're literally going to do that. So do me a favor, stick your hand up if you're standing. I'll tell you why, because in a moment I'm going to get everyone to come round you, and as soon as everyone stands up, nobody will know who's standing. So would you now go and stand with your friends? These are people that we love and trust, people that know you. Gather round them. If you're a visitor, perhaps you'd put both hands up in the air so that we, we might send some of the ministry team around. So we've got some visitors here that may not know people in the church. We honour you and respect you, but we just got to make sure that some people who really want to bless you and stand with you. Put your hand down when somebody comes to be with you. So there's a lovely lady here who's just standing up. There's somebody at the back, and there's a gentleman here. The gentleman here is a visitor, both hands in the air, so he, he, he would love to be prayed for. We just want to make sure this is done honorably and with some integrity. Anybody not being prayed for? Right, let me pray, and there's nothing special about my prayer, but I'm just going to amen what we've been talking about. Actually, this is as you get prayed for. And in a moment, I want everyone to pray their hearts out over you, to ask God to fill you with the Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have restored our relationship with God. Jesus, you've put us right that we were once alienated. We didn't have this relationship, but in Christ, it's been restored. In Jesus, we've been brought back into our original purpose to mirror you, Lord, to be made in your image and to rule and reign in life, to be fruitful, to increase in number, to multiply. And right now, Lord, we pray for our sisters. We pray for our brothers. And in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray for an empowering of the Holy Spirit. We pray, come Holy Spirit. Right now, as we lay hands on them, Lord, fill them again with love. Fill them again with power. I want to ask you, Lord, that tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right through the week, Lord, that they would find that they are full of the love of God for friends, full of the love of God for work colleagues, full of the love of God for family and neighbours. I want to ask you, Lord, you give them works and words, words to say and works to do. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, they demonstrate the love of God in every aspect of life. Now, why don't you just pray for them? Why don't you just ask God to fill them with the Spirit? Just come on them powerfully, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.